Guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Wednesday, August 23rd, 2023, and today marks a very interesting day. I am very excited to be in this position where we are heading into straight the 2024 Republican presidential debate, the first one of its kind. We will see probably up to six or seven by the end of the primary season, should there be enough candidates to get that far. Uh, it will be a very, very interesting debate tonight. At 9 p.m. Eastern Time, the Fox News Network will be hosting this debate. It will be moderated by two prominent journalists on the Fox News Network. I imagine that there will be other networks that will host them in the future. I don't know what we will see in terms of continued participation following this debate because the requirements will be raised and have been raised ahead of the next RNC sanctioned debate. But the main takeaway from this is that I would say, at least, there is a lot that we can expect from this evening and a lot that actually might change the trajectory of the current status of the GOP primary. Now, we know that there have been a number of candidates who have qualified for the debate. I will run through them right now, but a notable absence is President Donald Trump, where we see a lot of people overshadowing this debate because Donald Trump simply isn't there. Right now, he's in a position where he is with uh, Tucker Carlson, the prominent journalist from the uh, Fox News Network again, who was pushed out following the Dominion, uh, Dominion Voting Systems lawsuit that lost Fox News over a half a billion dollars. He was pushed out of the network, fired uh, with very little notice. So in a big snub to Fox News, not only is Tucker Carlson interviewing Donald Trump, which is a huge thing for Tucker Carlson, it's happening alongside the same time as the debate. And I think this is where we will really see who is paying attention to what. I do imagine the debate will get a lot more attention simply because the debates are always interesting and more fun to watch when there's more people than just a one-on-one -on -one interview. But there is also that concern here for the mainstream GOP that there won't be enough people watching because all the voters that they want to sway towards other candidates will be also watching the Tucker Carlson interview and maybe instead opting out of watching this debate. But like I said, I told you I would tell you who the candidates are from left to right, top row to bottom row. Let's go ahead and get through it. So first things first, we have Governor Chris Christie from the state of New Jersey. We know who he is. He ran for president in 2016, was a very anti-Trump person, then became a pro-Trump person, and now is anti-Trump again. Very much here to take on uh, Donald Trump. The next person that we have, Vivek Ramaswamy. You know him. Maybe you don't. He's a businessman, has risen into third place nationwide in national polls. In some polls, second place. Has done a lot better than anyone could have expected. He was a nobody just a few months ago and has now centered himself within, practically speaking, he will be at the center of the debate because of his polling performances, has made himself a major name within the GOP. Vice President Mike Pence, uh, Governor Ron DeSantis. We know these people. We've talked about them very heavily. We know UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, who was also governor of South Carolina, also a critic of President Trump, but wasn't always, was in 2016, similar to Christie, joined the Trump chain, was part of the administration, went against him back and forth now, a little wishy-washy there. Governor Asa Hutchinson from the state of Arkansas. Donald Trump seems to have a very uh, particular hatred for this guy. Uh, Governor Doug Burgum, who actually today uh, was uh, injured. He tore his Achilles tendon. He might not be standing at the GOP debate, but he will be there. So an emergency room procedure last night occurred, not today, yesterday. Um, but still, you know, that's just a little bit of a point of interest. Maybe it'll be some concern. I don't know what we will see because now they will have to accommodate somebody who is sitting at the debate stage. And then of course, Senator Tim Scott. Again, you probably know who that is. If you don't, South Carolina Senator who was coincidentally, or maybe not, appointed by Governor Nikki Haley when she was governor of the state during her time in office. So these eight people will be on the debate stage this evening. There will be uh, a lot of mudslinging, a lot of conversation, but we don't know exactly what we will see from this debate. So this video really, I mean, sure you can tell from the title of the video, is what we're expecting from this debate. But what we can expect to see doesn't necessarily just mean who we expect to win. Looking at where we are in terms of uh, national support for many of these candidates, many of them just simply aren't viable in the way that they need to be. Many of them are in low single digits, and the only reason why they are having such a prominent debate status is because the debate threshold has been lowered quite a bit. And you can see that on the national average, there obviously is a clear front runner. President Donald Trump uh, jumps in at 55% of the national vote on the GOP side, the second place candidate being Governor Ron DeSantis at 14%, Vivek Ramaswamy, I just mentioned him uh, previously, in third place at 7%, and everybody else is lower than 5 Vice President Mike Pence is at four. Uh, UN Ambassador Nikki Haley is at three. Senator Tim Scott is at three. Uh, Governor Chris Christie is at three, right? And then everyone else, and including two on the debate stage, Asa Hutchinson and Doug Burgum, 
are at less than 1%. So we sort of have moved the scale here to a point where the most prominent person on the debate stage is at 14%. The second most prominent person on the debate stage is at 7%. So we should not necessarily expect much movement in terms of national polls. Because the problem here is that the Republican Party, uh, if they do not want Donald Trump need to be the nominee, they need to get him on a debate stage. These voters here that are supporting him aren't going to drop him simply because he isn't showing up to the first debate. He has made valid arguments as to why he believes he should not be at the debate stage. Now, personally speaking, I think every politician should be going forward in some cases, right? When you are the non-incumbent, I think for President Trump, he's treating it as if he's on his re-election bid, which in a way is true, but in actuality isn't because he's not the sitting office holder. If he was, it would make sense for him to entirely skip these debates. But politically speaking, his points are valid, right? The ones that he says, I'm up so high, they want me on the debate stage so they can tear me down. That's true. There's a reason why they want him on the debate stage, and it isn't because they like hearing his voice. It's because they want the opportunity here for someone like Governor Chris Christie to get on the debate stage, rip into him, and potentially siphon away votes, siphon him down. I don't think the effort here is to consolidate around a candidate, but rather hit at Donald Trump enough that that 55% turns into you know, 5% going to Christie, 10% going to DeSantis, 7% going to Nikki Haley, 2% going to Tim Scott, 3% going to Vivek Ramaswamy. And when you see that in actual in totality here, you see that Donald Trump would dip down to below 40%. Those minute, seemingly, pulls away of support, uh, you know, uh, grabs of support from this voting base could be jeopardizing to the Trump campaign. Because right now, he's 5% above a majority. He's above where he needs to be. And He's going to maintain this as long as he stays out of scrutiny. What we can expect tonight, though, is that I do imagine some candidates will try to take him on. But as an invisible figure, as somebody who wasn't there, this isn't the John Ossoff, David Perdue debate where one person doesn't show up. This is just a national debate where there will be seven other candidates. And if DeSantis is going after Trump, you are going to see the candidates go after DeSantis. If Christie is going after Trump, you will see a lot of the candidates also turn on him as well to display their loyalty. There will be a very, very interesting dynamic here. Um, but on, on another point of what we can expect to, uh, you know, the 538 article here really goes into uh, levels of popularity. They go into what issues matter the most. I don't know if this debate will be about the issues, if it will be about anybody but each other. I think all of them roughly stand for the same thing. This isn't a general election debate, though they may have minute differences about how they have governed in the past, how they plan to govern in the future. Generally speaking, this will be about character. And that's why favorability does matter. It does matter how much public opinion does change about these candidates when they're exposed or not exposed or reaffirmed or pushed down when it comes down to this debate. And what we also know from the DeSantis campaign, at least, from Never Back Town, which is a super PAC that doesn't directly coordinate with the DeSantis campaign, but has very much been backing him from the very beginning, pushed him into the race, has been funding him, sending out ads on his behalf. They sent out a memo, which was either leaked or publicly released to the internet. I don't know why you would publicly release something like this, but it was a debate strategy. And I think maybe the reason why it was publicly released, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it was, there is a possibility it was leaked, but... I remember reading the article just yesterday, uh, seeing that it was uh, publicly released. Largely, a lot of the time, these are done to have the media question the DeSantis campaign, pressure them into following suit, because who's going to actively defy your super PAC that is publicly supporting you when they go public as well? So the argument here was that DeSantis, one, needed to defend Donald Trump. In his absence, needed to be his backing because DeSantis, believe it or not, even though he's at 14%, is still relatively liked amongst the mainstream GOP. You can see here that Donald Trump has a 65.5% favorability rating as a person. This isn't necessarily about job approval, but how do you like him, right? And the second most popular candidate is Ron DeSantis. No other candidate is above 50%. No one is above this point, this threshold, besides DeSantis and Trump. And if DeSantis becomes too anti-Trump, because he's been shying away from this, he has not been going after the former president in the way the former president has been going after him, because these voters like DeSantis. He is their second choice. If he becomes their last choice, his favorability drops, his future electability drops. You know, all these things matter, right? And so the next thing that DeSantis' campaign was expected to do, and maybe it will actually happen tonight, is go after Vivek Ramaswamy. And again, 
This is a no-name candidate from months ago who has become a very well-known name. He is somebody who no one thought was going to do well in a similar fashion to other candidates before, started out polling in less than 1%, started off with 0.3%, has worked his way up to above senators, governors, former vice presidents. It's crazy to think about, but it's the way that this primary has gone. And so the DeSantis campaign really wants to go after him. Why? Well, DeSantis' numbers have dropped in a very interesting correlation with an increase in Vivek Ramaswamy's support. And while I don't think necessarily that there is a direct you know, I guess, rationale to draw these two together. I do think there is something to be said that DeSantis is dipping and needs the support base from a non-Trump candidate because they have tried tirelessly to win over the Trump base and they have failed. So I think this evening we will see, potentially speaking, DeSantis going after Ramaswamy, DeSantis defending Donald Trump, and everybody else, guess what? going after DeSantis. I think there will be very few people this debate night that will go after President Trump. And I say that only because we have these candidates here who have been very loyal to him in the past and maybe were anti him in 2016. But think about it this way, right? Mike Pence voted for Ted Cruz in the Indiana primary before becoming Donald Trump's VP. Ron DeSantis would only be here because of Donald Trump. Nikki Haley would only be here because of Donald Trump, right? Tim Scott would only be here because of Nikki Haley. And Tim Scott has been very much loyal to President Trump. Scott has been defending him, right? DeSantis has been defending him. Nikki Haley has been defending him. Vivek Ramaswamy loves Donald Trump. Doug Burgum, not too anti-Trump, not too pro-Trump either. Asa Hutchinson has been in very bad graces with the former president. Very clear that they do not get along, but his impact isn't really noticeable. What we do see here, though, is that of the candidates who I can imagine being very outspoken towards the former president, I only see Chris Christie. I only see him and maybe Vice President Mike Pence, who has been taking a very pacifist approach when it comes down to media interview questions around the former president, conversations around him in debates uh, or, or in town halls, in rallies, in speeches that he's giving to you know the crowds that are along the same lines of Turning Point USA and pro-life organizations and young conservative groups, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Chris Christie's the only one who was really taking him on. And that's why it's very interesting, right? Chris Christie might be the only one who actually takes a shot at the one person who everybody benefits from taking down. Another thing is, I think a lot of these people are now playing for the vice presidential spot. Tonight, they are auditioning to put themselves at the bottom of the ticket for President Trump. And I don't say that to discredit any of their candidacies or viabilities in the sense of, their legitimacy to run. I think that they all have the uh, necessary qualifications as all of the other candidates do to be in this position where they are running. And I don't like to take down candidates and say, oh, they're just running to be VP because they are obviously putting themselves out there for a reason. They do believe that their vision for the country would be best, but they're also practical people. These are not candidates who don't know what the polling data is saying. They are very aware of where the betting markets are. They are very aware of where the polling data is. They're very aware of where the money is and where the support is, right? So when they go to Iowa and they see Donald Trump pulling in crowds of thousands, and while crowd sizes aren't everything, look at the 2020 election, look at the 2020 Democratic primary, they do tell a story on the Republican side. And I think they do feed into this narrative that has been very much backed up by real data, real fundraising numbers, real endorsements that show that Donald Trump is going to be the nominee. It's very difficult at this point in time to really understand just how large of a lead Donald Trump has. It's incomprehensible because in recent history, we've never had a Republican primary dominated so heavily for such an extended period of time. I mean, you can literally go back decades and see that you don't see this happening. 2007, you can see here that Rudy Giuliani was on track to becoming the Republican nominee. In 2011, Mitt Romney led by just 1.8%. And even in 2015, when Donald Trump was the candidate for president, he was only ahead by 11 points. And by the time you finished the GOP primary, he still wasn't ahead by a margin of more than 25 points. So the takeaway from here is these candidates are on this debate stage to, yes, shift a lot of these polls. We should expect many of them to go after one another in a very similar fashion to what we saw in 2016. And as it happened in 2016, only one person benefited quite consistently, and that was President Donald Trump. So where we are today, there will be infighting. There will also be a lot of people making that pitch to him indirectly, showing that they will defend him while also defending themselves, showing them that they will go after his enemies, which in this case are Ron DeSanctimonious, as he says it here, Governor Chris Christie, and somehow Asa Hutchinson amongst the rest of the pack. They will go after him and they, they will go after them to prove themselves, I think, in a way that will be very, very interesting to watch because this GOP primary debate 
is probably one of the least well polling groups that we have seen. Even in 2016, when there were two debate stages for the sheer amount of candidates that were in the race, I think it is just fascinating to see that a lot of these candidates here polling so low are being platformed so highly. That's why I think the RNC has now raised the debate standards. You now, I think, have to poll above 3% or 3% plus in national polls, some type of raising of the standards, some type of uptick in the donor threshold. I think this is the last saving grace for many of these GOP candidates. And by the time this debate is over, it might make or break their campaign entirely because if they can't fundraise, if they can't improve in polling, you can always offer those $20 gas cards for a $1 donation, but you can't improve the polling unless you are somehow sabotaging uh, the, the uh, validity of a poll unless you organically get that support. It's very easy to cross that 1% threshold for many of these candidates who have slight name recognition. Asa Hutchinson announced early on, Doug Burgum has been putting out ads constantly and constantly, and the rest are not necessarily household names for the GOP, but almost there for many of them, household names for certainly Trump, DeSantis, etc. But where we are today, I think we will find a very interesting turnout of this debate. I don't think it's going to change much about who the eventual nominee will be, but I certainly think it could determine who the vice president will be uh, or the VP nominee for the GOP could be. And I also think that we will just see some fluctuation amongst this remaining 30 to 40 percent that is anti-Trump. And we will see slight movements. It could make or break DeSantis's campaign, really improve Ramaswamy's. But for the rest, I would expect it to be around stagnant just based off of where they are today and the expectations that we have for them at this debate. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Make sure to tune in tonight to the GOP debate if you're interested in watching. I will be putting out a rapid response video about the winners and losers of tonight's GOP debate. So keep a close eye. We're really going to be watching it very heavily. It'll be very, very interesting. And again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all later today.